The information provided in this video is for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. You should contact an attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. Today's conversation with music attorney Cassandra Spangler is about music and technology. And speaking of technology, we'd like to give a shout out to Zencaster. Zencaster is the platform we use to record this conversation and we were both quite impressed. And thank you to Billy Dees for recommending Zencaster to me. You can check out Zencaster and the Billy Dees podcast via the links below. And now, here's our conversation. So today we're talking to Cassandra Spangler, and Cassandra is a music attorney, and we're going to be talking about the intersection of music and the music industry and the technology industry. So Cassandra is based out of New York City, and she's really a wonderful attorney, but not only is she an attorney, but she's also a musician, an artist, and that is firsthand experience that allows her to fully relate to her clients. And if you are wondering how I can make this crazy statement about her so confidently, um, well, it's because I'm actually one of her clients. So full disclosure here. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you want to get in touch with Cassandra, you can visit her at her website at cspanglermusiclaw.com. And of course, I'll put a link in the notes below the video. So don't worry about that. Cassandra, do you have anything that you want to add before we kind of move on? No, I think um, that's it. It's always great speaking with you, Janae. I think this is what the third one of these that we have done. It is. Is it is we we've actually done a discussion about music ownership, um, and we talked about like the general information that artists need to know and be aware of, which was super important um, stuff that we discussed. And if you anybody out there missed those discussions, don't worry. Of course, I will put a link below so that you can get to those discussions. And we're going to talk about other things. Didn't we agree on that, Cassandra? Yes branching out. Yeah, we're going to be talking about some really cool things in the future. So if you want to be um, made aware of any of our future conversations, and of course, I do other things on my channel, um, but so that you don't miss out, just subscribe. It's pretty much that simple. And if you find whatever we're talking about helpful, it's always nice if you like the video and, of course, comment. So if we are all set there, let's move on to our topic, which, Cassandra, you're the one that came up with this topic. Do you want to tell people how that came about? Sure. Yeah. Initially, I was kind of inspired um, by, so there was a New York Times article that came out, I think, at the end of December of 2019. Um, where they were interviewing Jimmy Iovine and they were talking about this topic of kind of like music versus tech and the tensions that have existed for a while between the two industries. And so that article kind of got me thinking. Um, and then last month I was out in Anaheim at the NAM conference, um, which is the National Association of Music Manufacturers. Um, so they had, of course, all kinds of new technology set up there. They had talks about new apps and different ways for artists to use social media and use other sites and things. Um, so that kind of got me thinking about it even more. And I think it's a really important topic because I think that, you know, we've already started to see a big shift in terms of the way that the music industry operates and the intersection with the tech industry and also uh, most importantly, maybe for our listeners is, you know, the ways that they can benefit through this new technology and how artists can use this technology and use these new tools that are available to help get their music out there, to help make sure they're collecting all of the different revenue streams um, and all kinds of different things. So um, going back about 20 years, just to give some context and some background to everything that's happening now. So the late 90s, early 2000s, that's when we started to really see MP3 become really popular uh, with music. So prior to that, it had been all about CDs. And then there was this new technology, which was MP3, um, which created a way of listening to music and storing music um, in a format that was much different than a physical CD or a vinyl record or a cassette tape. So around that same time, 
when music started to be on MP3s, we started to see these file sharing programs. Uh, most infamously was Napster. Um, it was these programs basically allowed people to share MP3 music files and download them for free. So at that point, really, the music industry was in a little bit of a crisis. Um, because suddenly consumers were able to share music and obtain music without paying for it. So a lot of the labels and other large companies within the music industry really freaked out. And they said, what are we going to do about this? Um, and prior to that point, Sony had been really the leader in terms of portable music electronics. So they had um, in the 80s, they had the Walkman, which was the portable cassette player. Then they had the Discman in the 90s, which was the portable CD player. They had the portable boom boxes. Um, and they were really the leader in that field. When MP3s started to come out and file sharing started to become a problem, Sony decided that they did not want to release an MP3 player because they felt it was too big of a risk. And that if they started selling MP3 players, people were, it was kind of encouraging people to go and download MP3s and not buy music. So they took a step back. Um, and then Apple, which prior to this point had not been a music company, they kind of stepped in and they said, you know, there's a demand for this. People are going to continue with these MP3s, whether it's legally or illegally. So we might as well figure out a way of meeting that demand and doing it in a way that allows, you know, some revenue to come in from it. So that, of course, is when they created the iPod on the iTunes store. And in doing that, they sort of solved a lot of the problems at once. Um, they allowed people to have the portability of MP3s so that you could now carry your whole music catalog with you in this little tiny player. Um, and they created a way of doing it to where people were paying for them instead of just downloading them for free. And at that point, I think is where we really started to see a shift in the music industry away from some of the traditional players and the labels and some of the power started to go over to the tech industry. Um, and it's interesting because going back to this New York Times article, Jimmy Iovine actually said that that was the point where he started to get involved in tech because he previously, you know, his background was in music and he saw what Apple did in terms of the iPod and the iTunes store. And he saw that that was going to be the wave of the future and he wanted to be involved in it. And of course, ever since then, Apple has been one of the leaders um, in music in terms of, you know, they had the iTunes store and now they have Apple Music. Um, and so that was a really big shift at that point. And I think also at that point, a lot of power shifted back to music fans um, and also to artists because previously the labels had kind of um, a monopoly on the market in terms of what was in physical stores. It was very difficult for artists to tap into those physical distribution networks on their own. Um, they had a stronghold over what was played on the radio. And before the internet, you know, the radio and maybe MTV were really the only ways of kind of hearing and discovering new music um, other than going out to live shows. So th at this point, everything really started to shift more in favor of the music consumers. And I think the music companies were very, very scared of that because they had a model that had worked very well for them for a very long time and they were making tons of money off of it. And suddenly that shifted um, and consumers sort of took back some of the control in that. And I think tech companies are not as scared of that. That's kind of where they thrive is these new disruptive technologies and tapping into what consumers want. Um, and so they really stepped in and started to play a bigger role in the music industry at that point. So that's a little bit of the background. And feel free to stop me at any time, or otherwise I'll just keep going. Yeah, no, you know, I think maybe because um, I'm, I'm of a certain age and pretty much know about, you know, Walkman and, and all that stuff. And, and maybe some younger folks have never even seen a Walkman. Um, I remember this whole transition thing pretty well. I remember fighting against it quite a bit. I still had a Walkman when everybody else had an MP3 player. Yep. So um, this is absolutely amazing to, to look back over the last 20 years or so and, and see how far we've come. Yeah. And you know, what's crazy is that I, I still use an iPod. And I get laughed at um, by younger generations. Some of them don't even know what it is. 
And some of them are like, oh my God, you still have an iPod. So it's crazy how quickly things have moved forward um, because there was a point where, you know, that was the new thing. And now 10 or 15 years later, suddenly that's considered to be old technology um, because we've moved over to streaming, um, which has really also changed a lot of the business model. So we had MP3s downloaded through the iTunes store. And then we started to see providers like Spotify coming in with streaming where suddenly, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, the cool thing was being able to carry your whole catalog around with you on a little device. And that was revolutionary. And now with streaming, it's like you have access to not only your catalog, but the world's catalog um, at any time on demand, which is really pretty cool. I mean, streaming gets a lot of, you know, negative press because the payments are lower and artists don't get paid as much songwriters don't get paid as much um, which isn't great but I think there are also a lot of positive aspects of it in terms of just the amount of music that it gives people access to also when I was at this conference there was an artist who was speaking about streaming and she was speaking about how a lot of people complain because they don't get paid very much from streams um, but she said you know in that's one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it is that you're getting paid over and over and over again, just in smaller amounts. So it used to be someone would go buy your CD one time and you would get your royalty off of that. And now they may listen to your album 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, and you're getting paid a little bit each time. So it's less money, but it's spread out over a longer period of time. Absolutely. And, you know, and as an artist myself, I'm thinking about that, you know, yeah, I mean, how cool would it be if everybody went out and bought one of my singles? But you're right, it, it would end there with streaming. It's not even just Spotify. They're all actually paying you every time. Well, some amount of money every time your song is streamed on all those different platforms. So if you're wildly popular and people are streaming your song every 10 minutes or every whatever on every platform, that can add up to a lot. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it sometimes is better, you know, to be receiving those checks for a longer amount of time um, than to just receive one at the beginning and then that's it. So there are, you know, pros and cons to it. And I think that the industry is still sort of figuring, trying to figure out exactly how to monetize streaming. Um, but I think that they have come a long way with it. And I think another important aspect of it that we're starting to see is this emphasis on data. So, you know, whenever you're streaming, there's all this data that goes along with that. So, you know, there's all this information that, Spotify has about your demographics, what you're shopping for online, where do you live, how old are you, uh, what type of news are you reading, all of those things that we all hear about um, with things that you're doing online. And of course, there's all the privacy issues involved, um, but there's also a lot of value, especially for artists, in that data. So if you can have access to knowing where most of your fans are geographically, what time of day are they listening? What day of the week are they listening? How many times are they listening? Um, what else are they listening to? And streaming allows artists to get access to all of that data, which is really, really valuable. And so I think that we're starting to see a lot of people now trying to figure out better ways of compiling it, better ways of monetizing it. You know, once you have that information, what do you do with it? So I think that's where a lot of the focus is on now. And I think we're going to see more and more focus on that in the future. Yeah. I mean, data obviously is important well, just about in every industry. But I remember back when I was doing internet radio uh, back in the 20,000s, I guess is the way you say it, um, it was really hard to, to come up with that data. And now here we are, you know, maybe 15 years later. And wow, like it's right at your fingertips now. It's really amazing how that works. Yeah, it is. I remember um, going to a talk in the early 2000s. I think it was the founders of Pandora. They were giving a talk and they were explaining how they had created this new internet radio that used algorithms. I think that was probably maybe the first time in my life I ever heard the word algorithm. And they were using algorithms to recommend music. 
So, and that at the time just seemed so revolutionary because previously when you're listening to the radio or you're watching MTV, you're seeing or hearing the same thing as everybody else who's listening. And then suddenly they started to create these systems where it was like tailored to you. It was your own personal radio station that was playing things that it thought you might like. Um, and of course, it's come a long way, even in the, since then. Um, now we have Spotify personalized playlists and all of these other things. But it's just really amazing um, what they've been able to do with that. So what else did you learn? Yeah, I think a few other areas that we're going to start to see expanding. Um, one is blockchain, which, to be honest, I still don't fully understand. I've had multiple people try to explain it to me, and it's just one of those concepts that I think difficult to grasp. Um, oh, thank you for saying that, because I just read an article about blockchain and I thought I'm going to get it this time. I have no idea. <laughs> same. Yeah, same here. Um, but what I have been able to grasp is, you know, usually you hear it in the context of like cryptocurrency. But I, what I if I'm understanding it correctly, there's a lot of other applications for it, um, including in music. So there are people that are working on ways of centralizing royalty payments. So right now it can be difficult to figure out and collect all these different revenue streams all over the internet. Um, and they're trying to use blockchain to make it easier to track, you know, every time your song is being played all, anywhere on the internet, you know, making it easy and centralized way of tracking that and collecting revenue from that making it easier to track down who owns the rights in songs because a lot of times, you know, I've had situations where clients will come to me and maybe they want to clear a sample that they used. And it's something that's old and obscure from the sixties. And it's just, they, they want to pay for it and they want to license it, but we can't figure out who owns it. So blockchain would make it easier to do that and easier to figure out who do we need to get in touch with to pay for this. Um, and then also, you know, there's this issue. So social media, of course, has been really beneficial in a lot of ways for artists. Um, but apparently there's also a lot of issues with fake accounts. So I was reading some statistics. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but they were saying that 50 to 60 percent of social media accounts are fake. Wow, that's a huge number. Yeah, huge. Um, and that makes it difficult for artists because it skews the data. Um, which we were talking about the value of data. It makes it harder to to verify that. Um, and so they're saying that blockchain is a way of cutting down on that. It's a way of sort of verifying whether or not accounts are real or not. I think that also may raise some privacy issues, which probably would be a topic for another discussion. But, you know, I think with all this, with data, with blockchain, there are some privacy issues that we're going to start to see as well. So it's just a matter of figuring how all of this is going to work. Um, also, we've seen recording technology has, and you can probably speak to this um, better than me, but it has come such a long way in such a short time as well. I mean, it used to be you had to pay to go to these fancy studios, and it was very expensive to set up a studio. It was very expensive to record in a studio. And now we see, you know, Billie Eilish, for example, winning multiple Grammys for an album that supposedly was primarily recorded in her bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have this technology now in terms of recording that is just, it's amazing the advances um, that technology has taken there too. Absolutely. I mean, just in the, and again, going back to the world of radio, I mean, when I was doing, when I was doing it, I was actually using, and I still have all this equipment, um, a, a CD recorder and three CD players all attached to a mixer. And then it was, you know, my microphone. And, and that was what I used. And you make a mistake. And guess what you have to do? Start all over again. Oh. So here comes all this wonderful technology where you can record into the computer now, you know, and I mean, everybody, I think at this point makes fun of Audacity, but Audacity is amazing. Um, you can record directly into the computer. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. You just keep going because you can edit that. <laughs> you know how much time I could have saved? 
Yeah, or even in the days before that where it was tape and you had to cut the tape and yeah. paste it together and it's crazy. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would have wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I think all of these things have such um, tremendous value for artists, especially independent artists, because it's removed a lot of the expenses and it's, it's creating more access, direct access for artists to their fans whether it's through social media, whether it's being able to record an album in your bedroom when you don't have a budget for a studio and then easily put it out um, onto all the streaming sites. Um, I think that all of this, all of these technological tools are really, really great um, for artists. And they've, again, they're, they're providing direct access from artists to their fans. And I think that it will be interesting to see how labels um, you know, what their role is over the next 10 or 20 years, because I think they're, they're becoming less and less, more and more just a sort of a bank or a marketing machine, um, which don't get me wrong, does have a lot of value, but it's no longer a matter of, oh, you have to, you have to sign to a label or else you're never going to make it. Um, now with all this technology, you know, there, there's really no limit to what an artist can do with a cell phone and a laptop. So, oh, Definitely. And, and going, you know, not just radio, but in my own music, Mike and I used to record in his home studio. That's back when I lived up north closer to him. And now that I am a million miles away, actually, we, we still work together almost the same exact way, except now I, I do go into a, a studio to record the vocals. Um, but you know, it all gets put together via the computer, and and we 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 haven't actually physically seen each other in over a year, and yet we're still making music together. So technology has definitely made it easier to record and put out music, and social media has given you access to a lot more people for sure. There are people doing mini concerts in their bedrooms. Yeah. For hundreds if not thousands of people yeah that's amazing yeah it's, it's very very cool and i think it'll be really cool to see how all of this develops i mean i think you know again we, we've come a long way um since napster in terms of figuring out okay how how do we legitimize this um and i think that the industry has come a long way with that and it'll be interesting to see what they do moving forward um, I mean, one of the interesting discussions that comes up sometimes is, you know, with streaming now, uh, we have streaming for music and then we have these streaming sites for TV now. We have Netflix, Hulu, Disney. Right. Um, and the interesting thing is that for some reason, consumers are willing to sign up for multiple TV streaming services. So people will have Hulu and Netflix, but they won't typically have multiple music streaming services. So if you're with Spotify, you're only with Spotify for the most part. And so I think that the industry needs to figure out a way, whether it's through exclusive content, um, which is why people are willing to do it with TV, because they want to get the Netflix shows and the Hulu shows um, or some other way of doing it. But I think that that's going to be a real challenge is how do we get people to, you know, not only listen to Spotify and maybe also listen to Apple, or is it going to be a matter of, you know, some of these services are going to go away and we're going to be left with just one, which I think will create some of the same problems that we had back in the 90s where, you know, you had these few handful of major labels and everything was under their control. And I think that we don't want to see that happening with streaming services. So it'll be interesting to see how all this turns out. Well, that is that is an interesting thought because, I mean, as an artist, you want your music in as many different places as possible. Um, and, and it makes me think of back when MTV first started back in the 80s. Um, and then along came VH1. Mm -hmm. And it was like this competition. Now, they both had the same music, you know, so that wasn't it. But it was the other content. So MTV started producing shows, you know, yeah. um, that you could not see on VH1 because it was an MTV show. So I'm wondering if you're absolutely, I mean, I know you're right on the mark here. And it's a matter of, yes, figuring out what content would be exclusive to 
say, either Pandora or Spotify or whatever, Apple Music or any of the other ones out there. I don't know why I can't come up with another service, but um, what's the Jay-Z one? Yeah, I was going to say Tidal. Um, Tidal's the Jay-Z one, and Tidal, I think, has tried that a little bit. They've, I think they've, they've tried um, some exclusive content. I think they had some um, live concerts that were only available, recordings of the concerts were only available on Tidal. And they had for a while, some art, I think Jay-Z for a while, pulled all of his music off every streaming service except Tidal. Um, but I know he recently went back onto Spotify. So I don't know, I don't know the numbers. I don't know if it's that it didn't work or what happened. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that's going to be a focus in figuring that out. How do we get people to want to subscribe to multiple and what kind of content is it that they want to see? Because I think music's a little different from TV. Like people want to see the storyline of a TV show. And with music, if, you know, if you're subscribing to Spotify and a certain artist is not on Spotify, it's less likely that you're going to go and sign up for another service just for that artist. Um, so it's like, how do we figure that out, you know? Well, well, I think Sirius XM kind of did it a little bit yeah. there because wasn't Howard only available there? And if you were a diehard Howard Stern fan, you were gonna you were gonna sign up for a Sirius XM. That's true. Yeah, I think they you're right. So I wonder if something like a podcast, a wildly popular podcast or ten, um, that is only with a certain service that that might make people go there. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, something where it's a series, you know, where people need to, to tune in to hear it yeah. on a regular basis. Absolutely. And again, it would, but it would have to be exclusive. Like you can't yeah. try to go everywhere with your little podcast. Um, you would sign with them and that's it. Yep. You know, and obviously that's, that's going to have to be a carrot involved with that. Yeah. Probably. So we're talking about payments maybe. So if your streaming services are listening. <laughs> yeah. Maybe think about paying some of these people to just go there with their podcasts and you might see it happen. Yeah. What about these industry apps? Um, so there were discussions about a lot of different apps, um, and a lot of them, I think, are still in the testing phase, but they sounded like really cool concepts. Um, one of them, I think the name of it was Audigent, and they are basically working on a way, so going back to data, they are trying to figure out a way to compile data for artists across all of their different platforms. So all of the data from Spotify, all your analytics. Um, sorry, from like Instagram, all your analytics from Facebook, Spotify analytics, and compiling those all in one place so that you can see the difference of your fans across platforms and also the data about your entire fan, play, uh, fan base across all the different platforms. So that one sounded really cool to me. And then there's also Patreon, which um, is not just an app, it's also a website, and it's not super new, but I think the concept behind Patreon is really cool where you can support artists that you like, you know, so if they want to release a new album, their fans can donate or I guess donate's not the correct word. It's really you're paying them for their services to create an album that you want to hear. Um, and I think that's a cool concept, too, because, again, it's cutting out the middleman. So now artists can just go directly to their fans and rather than paying a label who then takes their cut and pays the artist, you're just giving your money directly to the artist and then they can take it and use these. Um, inexpensive recording technologies and create the album and release it to their fans. Um, so I think that's another cool one. There was another one, um, I'm not remembering the name right now, but it was designed to help artists with merch sales so that if you ha are playing a show and you're selling merch, um, it's all done through an app. And the fan can even just, you know, go and, and purchase a T-shirt on the app while they're at the show and have it shipped to their house if they don't want to carry it around with them. Um, or, oh, wow. yeah, they can just make the payment through the app. And it also allows the artist to keep track of what type of merch items are selling in which, city, which cities um, on the tour and that type of thing. So. I think really in every different facet of the facet of the industry, whether it's touring or merchandise or publishing or record sales, we're starting to see all these different cool apps that people are coming up with 
um, which makes artists' lives easier and more efficient and everything else. So um, very cool. Yeah, all, all this stuff that people are coming up with. Yeah, and you know that that merch one is interesting because now the artist doesn't have to lug around tubs and tubs yep. of T-shirts and CDs if they are selling CDs or even vinyl. Um, they don't need to do that. They can have maybe just a sample of what it looks like, maybe the size, yeah, <laughs> you know, all the different sizes and whatever, and, and then say, okay, pick one, and now it'll be at your house when you get home, you know? Yeah, definitely. Was was there anything else in apps? I think that's it. I mean, I would sort of challenge artists to explore all these different apps um, and look for apps. If there's a problem that you're having or a challenge. Um, so, for example, if you were having difficulty figuring out how to get all your merch to your shows, um, see if there's an app for that. And in that instance, there is. Um, but any other type of issues that you're having trouble with, um, because, again, for independent artists, especially they are now really running a business. You know, it's not just a matter of going in the studio and handing off the recordings to the label and letting the label deal with all the rest of it. If you're an artist who's self-releasing, you really are running a business. And so all of these different apps are tools at your disposal to make that easier and make that more efficient for you. And, you know, also a lot of artists, it's, it's difficult to keep track of the counting as um, an artist who's self-releasing. So if you have someone on your album and you're supposed to be paying them royalties, you know, that can be very difficult for an artist to keep track of. So explore different apps that can help you with the accountings, um, explore apps that can help you with marketing or help you with touring or, you know, any other issue that you're having. Um, check out all these apps that people are coming up with and find some that, that work for you. You know, and it just occurred to me, too, I mean, just like I wasn't just born and then I just did the music industry, there are artists and um, people out there in the music industry that actually come from the tech world. Yeah. And so if you are finding that, oh, God, I really wish there was you know, an app for this or a way to do this, hey, how about create it? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about another stream of revenue there. I mean, wow. Yeah. So any tech people out there that are musicians and are, and are going, God, I really wish they had something for this, create it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And share it because chances are you're not the only one that says, I wish there was. I mean, that's how most things are invented, right? I wish there was this. And so and there isn't. So you go out and you make it. So same same thing with music. Same thing. Definitely. Yep. And, and don't assume that just because it hasn't been done means it's not viable. I'm mean, going back to the beginning of the talk where, you know, we talked about Apple stepping in. Um, all of these leaders in the music industry passed on creating an MP3 player. And Apple, you know, didn't let that stop them. They came in and they did it and they did it very well. And here they are, you know, one of the leading um, service providers. So, you know, use that as a sort of motivation um, and coming up with new ideas and new innovative ways of addressing problems and making things easier for artists. Absolutely. That's a, a wonderful point. You're right. Yeah. They weren't in the music industry and yet they're the ones that came up. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> with where we are now. Amazing. So where do we go from here? Yeah, I think that's, that's the question. Um, you know, figuring out how to better monetize these things, um, you know, figuring out how to create uh, systems so that artists can make enough money to, you know, make a living and continue creating music. Um, I think that's the, the challenge. And I think, you know, a, again, the tech industry is an industry that's really thriving. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there to tap into that. You know, and if you're an artist, you, you don't have to wait necessarily for the music industry to embrace the technology because that may not happen. Um, it's always very slow to do that, which we've talked about. So to the extent that you as an artist can can embrace that first um, and make it work for you, then I think you should do that. Um, and then I think eventually the industry will kind of catch up with all this and figure out ways of doing it. Um, I think some of the laws will catch up, 
you know, some of the copyright laws, they're starting to update those to address new technology, which I think will be beneficial for artists and songwriters as well. Now, was this your first time going to this conference? It was, yeah. It was very cool. I recommend it. Any any artists out there, um, you know, if you're interested in learning, seeing the different instruments that are coming out and testing out things and meeting up with other artists, um, I highly recommend it. It was a, a really good time. A lot, a lot of people there from all, I think from all facets of the industry, really. So it's a good place to meet people, network learn about new things that are coming out. They also have a lot of really great um, panels and lectures, which I feel like are a little bit underappreciated. Um, didn't seem like those were as popular to everyone else as they were to me. I mean, that was kind of my main aspect of it that I was interested in was going to these panels. Um, but if you do end up going, definitely check out those panels. They have a million different topics. So I'm sure there'll be something that will interest everyone. And they have an app. Speaking of apps, the conference has an app so that you can plan out. It's four days long, um, and the app is a really useful tool to plan out your day. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely recommend. And it's in California. I assume it's always in California, but maybe they're going to change the venue at some point. Yeah, as far as I know, and, it, and it's right next to Disneyland. So if anybody, you know, you can pack two trips into one if that's something that you're interested in. Oh, fun. Was there anything else on, on the topic that you wanted to go over? I would just encourage people, if there was something you heard that sounded interesting to you, um, to look more into that, because tech is definitely not my specialty. So a lot of this stuff is new to me, too. Um, but I think that it's important for everyone in the industry to kind of learn. Sometimes it's like, you know, you've been doing something one way for so long, you don't want to learn the new technology. But if you do that, you're going to get passed up by people who do. So, you know, definitely keep yourself educated, whether you're an artist or you're on the business side of things or both. Um, keep updated and, and familiarize yourself with all this new stuff that's going on. Yeah, definitely. I think that if you don't, it, it will totally pass you by. And then when you finally do decide to look into it, you'll probably be completely overwhelmed because um, it is always changing. So I'm thinking, you know, I mean, I learned a whole bunch. I didn't know. Um, I mean, I, I know that this stuff is happening. I guess I just didn't really think about how it relates to music. They are two different industries, and yet they are melting together. And um, it's interesting to think about it that way, technology and music. Um, and I just don't think I'll ever get the blockchain thing. It's just not going to happen. So other people will have to be yeah, <laughs> well-versed in blockchain. And if you think you can explain it to me, so I understand, you know, let me know because I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, same, same here. <laughs> Maybe it's one of those things where you have to kind of like see it in action and then, then we'll understand. But for right now, it just doesn't, yeah, it doesn't connect. So, oh, well, you can't know everything, right? Right. Very good. So people, once again, if you want to get in touch with Cassandra Spangler, you can reach her at cspanglermusiclaw.com. She's got a lovely little website there and all different ways that you can contact her through that. Um, and I know you're all over socials, but again, that is all on your website. So people can just go to your website at cspanglermusiclaw.com and find you and contact you as it says on the website. Correct? That's right. Yep. All of my info is on there. And again, I can say that, you know, you're my lawyer. So um, yeah, and you're wonderful. So I wouldn't be doing this if you weren't. So that's my little testimonial. Thank you. And I always appreciate um, you taking the time to have me on and it's always um, a lot of fun and really cool what we end up coming up with. So thank you, Janae. Thanks for taking your time. And I am so excited about our future talks because we have some cool stuff coming up. We do. And I think people will yep. appreciate that as well. Yep. Thanks for listening to my conversation with music attorney Cassandra Spangler. Don't forget to check out all the links below, subscribe to my channel, turn on notifications by ringing the bell, like and comment, and now go forth and create. I, I just want